<clears throat> Hello, welcome to our Latin American webinar on physics number 151. We are very excited because this is the beginning of our season number 16. And our guest today is Professor Ken von Tiborg, who will give an epic seminar and we'll talk about that later. So Professor Tim Van Tilburg is an assistant professor at the uh, New York University and the Flat Iron Institute. He got his PhD at Stanford University. And after that, he was a postdoc at the Institute for Advanced Studies at Princeton and at the same time as uh, at uh, New York University. And after that, he was for a, a brief period of time, a postdoc at the Kavli Institute for Theoretical Physics in Santa Barbara before joining uh, NYU as a, an assistant professor. Today, he will give us a talk on his recent research on extended path intensity correlation or EPIC for a short. Thank you very much, Ken, for being with us. We're looking forward to your seminar. Remember, for you all following the transmission on YouTube that you can ask your questions on the chat of, of YouTube, uh, or you can send your, uh, your questions via Twitter. And make sure that you follow us on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, so that you are posted on the upcoming webinars. We have one next week, for example. All right, so take it away, Ken. Thank you very much, and good luck. Thank you, Walter, for the invitation. Um, yeah, so let me share my screen and start the presentation. Okay. Um, yeah, so uh, again, thank you so much for the invitation. and. Please, please feel free to ask questions. Uh, I'm I'm happy to provide extra clarification during during the presentation. So, I will be talking about work that I've been uh, conducting with uh, a postdoc at Perimeter Institute, Mario Scalanis, um, and then two faculty, Masha Baryaktar at the University of Washington, and Neil Weiner at, at my own institution. So, uh, what we propose is Epic, which is um, a variant of intensity interferometry, uh, which is a um, classic technique uh, invented in the 1950s by Hembury, Brown, and Twiss to very precisely measure stars. Um, and so many of you might not have heard about it, uh, and I will explain why uh, the technique was abandoned, and I'm advocating now to reinvigorate it uh, with a slight modification. Um, so the, the experiment, uh, the diagram is, uh, is, is shown on this slide. And if you want to read more details, they're, they're in a short letter here, uh, as well as a much longer paper, um, which is the second archive number here. Um, so uh, the reason uh, for inventing EPIC uh, was to use it for astrometry. So we'll give you a brief uh, introduction to astrometry, which is measuring the positions and motions of stars and other celestial bodies. Um, and I will uh, summarize the, the capabilities of uh, standard imaging telescopes like your eye and, 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 and standard telescopes. Uh, and I will also summarize the, um, the capabilities of amplitude interferometers, which is the current state of the art for, for astrometry. Um, then I will tell you about uh, intensity interferometry, so the, the old classic idea from the 1950s, um, and then some of its limitations, uh, which is uh, one of which we solve with our extended uh, path uh, addition to intensity interferometry. And then I will uh, outline the performance of this uh, device uh, based on realistic parameters and some technical details, but uh, I'll try to keep the technical details at a minimum, uh, but feel free to ask me afterwards. Uh, so the, the, the four authors of the paper are particle theorists, not observational astronomers. So our aim was mostly at, at the science because some of us um, had been thinking about how astrometry could benefit uh, fundamental physics as well as astrophysics. Um, and so uh, in, in, in the long paper, we outline a myriad uh, of applications um, in astrophysics and fundamental physics. So, so the things you can do with EPIC is uh, extreme precision measurements of, of um, many systems, including binary orbits, measuring their masses uh, and, and orbital parameters, uh, 
EPIC can be used to do exoplanet detection. That's maybe the most, uh, uh, the, the scientific case that's m mostly a home run. Uh, uh, one can perform stellar microlensing, um, uh, possibly measure galactic acceleration in the future, as well as uh, use it for more uh, cosmological applications like calibrating the cosmic distance ladder uh, and measuring gravitational lensing of uh, very small dark matter halos um, in a strongly lensed quasar system. And a few more, a few other applications that I haven't listed here, but um, that I might mention at the end. Okay, so it's, it's three parts. So let me start with the introduction. Uh, so astrometry is by far the oldest science, right? So we've been looking at the stars since, uh, since I don't know, I don't know exactly when uh, humans first started looking up, but a long time ago. Uh, so the 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 Greeks first <clears throat> made it into a a, a proper science. Uh, so in, in particular, Hipparchus, uh, you know, he invented trigonometry alongside um, me measuring stars. He, he measured the uh, Earth's uh, precession of of the spin axis and invented um, uh, an astrolabe, which is that uh, yellowish the device uh, depicted there, which is where he depicted uh, the stars on. And so he roughly uh, had a precision um, on the so global astrometric precision, so the the precision at which he made tick marks on this astrolabe of about twenty arc minutes, which is uh, maybe a maybe one percent of a of a radian uh, precision. Um, and so the, the, the limiting angular resolution of an eye just by the diffraction limit is about one arc minute, which is a factor of uh, 200 or, uh, or so, sorry, a factor of 20 or so smaller than the absolute precision. Um, so, uh, yeah, yeah, so Hipparchus was basically the inventor, um, of systematically, uh, cataloging the, the stellar positions, uh, although there's no written records, which were, um, uh, first evidence of which is uh, the Almagest by Ptolemy, and then I, this knowledge was preserved uh, by uh, uh, Al Sufi and, and and other Arab scientists. Um, and then uh, yeah, but really most most of the most of the observations were done with with just uh, uh, with the eye. Uh, the first person to to really systematically. Uh, improve upon it with with instruments was uh, Tycho Brahe, um, who invented this uh, mural. So light entered through that uh, a small hole in the wall, and then he could measure he could um, uh, measure the stellar position uh, on 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 a mural, uh, and and he achieved a ten minus four radian precision or so. Uh, of course, since then the telescope was invented, and I'll skip Galileo and everyone else in between. And so right now the state of the art. Uh, are in terms of imaging uh, telescopes on the ground, uh, are the 10 meter class telescopes, such as the Keck Observatory. So it's two 10 meter diameter telescopes. Um, and so these large telescopes are uh, limited by astronomical seeing, which is basically um, saying that the, the, the uh, atmosphere acts like a, a lens with some characteristic size of uh, 10 to 30 centimeters or so limiting your diffraction uh, limited resolution by the wavelength of the light over this uh, parameter, this freed parameter set by the atmosphere. Um, if you use adaptive optics, um, uh, as the Keck telescopes do, you can, you can improve upon this uh, and get the, the um, minimum resolution set by the wavelength over the diameter of your telescope. Um, um, in space, you can do, uh, much better, uh, or at least you don't have you don't have to use adaptive optics because you're, you're not limited by the atmosphere. So the first serious astrometric uh, space mission uh, was Hipparchos, the the satellite, not the person, um, launched in the late '80s, and it cataloged about ten to the five stars with ten milli arc second uh, precision per measurement on each of the stars. And right now. Um, uh, Gaia is running with a factor of 10 to the 4 increase in precision, uh, 10 to the 4 increase in catalog, and, and, a, and about a factor of a 100 in precision per measurement. And it, it also will run a, a little bit longer. It's still running 
to, to, to this day, um, and three years of data have already been publicly released. Um, so uh, Gaia has the same, roughly the same um, diffraction limited resolution. However, it can do exquisite light centroiding precision. So uh, it can, it can um, measure the, the position of the light centroid of a star to better than the resolution. It's rough, roughly by um, the signal to noise ratio of, of the detection of the star. Um, and so as you, see, as you can see, so the, the light centroiding precision for a typical star in Gaia can be, or for a relatively bright star in Gaia, can be about 100 micro arc second, whereas the 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 fiducial resolution is is a, a little only a little bit better than uh, one arc second. Um, let me just quickly mention spectrograph. So so uh, many ground and space based telescopes um, not only image the light, um, but they split it spectrally, right? So they let it impinge on a prism or a grating or a combination thereof. Um, and split it into different wavelengths, and then record the intensity as a function, a function of wavelength or, or frequency, uh, with the typical resolving power. So, wavelength over spread in wavelength um, uh, set by the uh, or depicted here on the y-axis. So, uh, as good as a factor of ten to the five, um, and a factor of a few thousand is doable with a standard diffraction grading. So, these are all of the instruments um, mounted on the Keck uh, telescopes. Okay, um, so that 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 was it for uh, quote unquote standard uh, imaging telescopes. Um, one can achieve <clears throat> even better um, light centroiding precision and astrometric resolution uh, using interferometry. So I will. So EPIC is a variant of intensity interferometry. So so let me contrast it with standard interferometry that, that you might be more familiar with, which um, to be precise is amplitude interferometry as opposed to intensity interferometry. So what you do there is, uh, so let's say you have a source S here. Um, what, what you do there is you record uh, the electric fields at telescope one and telescope two. So you record both the amplitude E sub S, which is the same at, at both sites, as well as the, the phase of the wave. So here I'm using this complex representation. Um, and this uh, the, the phase of source S at position J tells you, uh, you know, oscillates with uh, proportional to the frequency. It also knows about uh, the propagation phase from, from S to, to your telescope J. Um, and there might be some random phase uh, at the emission site. So I'm assuming that this phase is kind of random, so it's not a not a laser, it's some chaotic light source. Um, so the uh, you can use this for astrometry because the path difference uh, from S to 1 and S to 2 uh, has knowledge of the uh, position of the source. So in particular, in the small angle approximation, uh, it's proportional to sort of the the vector, the unit vector pointing to the source dotted into D, which is the, the baseline separation. Um, okay, so that's a lot of setup, but so what's the actual measurement? So you record the electric fields at sites one and two, and uh, you, if you can record, record it as a function of time, so if you can keep track of this oscillating phase, then at the end, um, you can uh, measure this correlation uh, E, of E1 and E2 star. Uh, and what you get is, is something proportional to the amplitude squared, which is typically difficult to calibrate. But in particular, you measure this, uh, this uh, path length difference in, in the relative phase. Um, and if you, use your, um, if you use the correct time offset, these random phases at the emission point are common in one and two. And uh, after you take the expectation value, which you can think of as taking the time average, um, that that if you take the if you set set the time offset right, uh, that cancels out to to one, and you just measure this uh, phase here, which is the position of the source. Um, and and so doing 
doing so actually gives you a fiducial resolution that's the wavelength of the light divided by the baseline separation D. So not the size of the telescopes, but just the total uh, baseline separation. And then again, if you measure this quantity very, uh, very accurately at high signal to noise ratio, then uh, you can do better light sorting, light centroiding precision by the by the SNR. Um, so amplitude interferometry one can perform in the radio band where electronics are fast enough to uh, keep up with this rapidly oscillating phase at hundreds of gigahertz. Uh, and so the Event Horizon Telescope. Uh, which is a collection of uh, radio observatories uh, around the world, uh, achieves a fiducial resolution of about 30 micro arc seconds. Uh, so that's what you get by taking uh, roughly one millimeter light divided by uh, the uh, diameter of the Earth, uh, approximately. Um, so that's the state of the art in the radio, and it's difficult to um, shorten the wavelength um, and, and measure the uh, this rapidly oscillating phase correctly while keeping uh, atmospheric aberration atmospheric phases at bay and of course it's hard to increase the baseline beyond the size of the earth unless you do you go to space um so uh one way to one way to shorten the wavelength is to do it in the optical so electronics are are not fast enough to keep track of this phase uh, in the optical um, or infrared, but what you can do is physically recombine the light. So rather than recording the electric fields individually, um, you can let them impinge on uh, on some apertures here. And then, so if this is e E1 recorded here and E2 recorded there, you can uh, physically recombine the light and interfere it and, and look at um, uh, look at interference outputs and, and beat nodes. So uh, which means you don't have to keep track of a, a, of a optically so a, an optical uh, phase oscillation. Uh, so that's what optical uh, Michelson interferometers do, such as the the Chara array and and other state of the art interferometers. So they achieve uh, 200 micro arc second uh, resolution at best. Uh, and that's what you get by taking an optical wavelength over uh, a few hundred meter uh, separation. I believe char is about 300 meters. Um, and this is difficult to improve significantly uh, because making the baseline longer than 300 meters is prohibitively expensive. So you need to know the relative distance between these telescopes to better than uh, a wavelength precision. So micron or better. Um, ideally a tenth of a micron or so. Uh, otherwise, you lose this uh, relative phase information. And that's just difficult to do over long distances, as we know from LIGO and, uh, and other experiments. Okay, so that's the, the state of the art. So, so right now, uh, with Gaia, with the Event Horizon Telescope, and with Chara and gravity and, and other amplitude interferometers, we can achieve... Uh, light centroiding uh, precision roughly at uh, at tens of micro arc seconds after after integrating for for some time uh, which is now the state of the art okay so that was my introduction to astrometry um, I will now tell you where intensity interferometry comes into play and then how astrometry can be used for these uh, specific uh, scientific applications Okay, so the basic idea, uh, well, sorry. So, so the, the, the premise of intensity interferometry is that uh, one can in principle achieve sub micro arc second resolution and possibly even better light centroiding precision. Um, and uh, so, so let me explain the, the, the basic idea. So just like in, in amplitude interferometry, uh, you have two telescopes observing, let's say, to start with one source. And rather than correlating the electric fields, one correlates the intensity field. So you record the intensity at site one as a function of time and the intensity at site two as a function of time, I1 and I2. And the, the, the quantity that or the actual observable in the end is this excess fractional intensity uh, correlation. So you, you take these two intensities, um, you 
time average them uh, and you divide by the, so you, you take the product, you time average them, you divide by the product of the averages and subtract one. If these intensities were completely independent, this final observable would be zero. But kind of counterintuitively, C is not zero. It, it, it's positive uh, in general for, for photons. Um, so so it's, it's an amazing fact that if you look at the sky with two telescopes that may be quite distant, distant the time the, the intensities at both sites are, are correlated, which means that the time of arrival of photons at, in one telescope and one that's quite distant would, would, be, would be correlated. Um, okay, so, so let me explain why. So if you, um, so here in the, on the top panels, I'm plotting I1 relative to the average and I2 relative to the average. So if, if your source is some chaotic light source, um, like a star, uh, so it's not not a laser. Um, the intensity actually has order one fractional variation, uh, fractional variation, because it's a superposition of many wavelengths with random phases. And so, if you put together a, uh, a superposition of, of many many uh, many wavelengths and with random phases, you get something that uh, actually has a variance of a fractional variance of two. Uh, sorry, uh, uh, yeah, a fractional fractional variance of two. So order one fractional variations. And so what that means is that the the intensity field at sites one and and two is exactly the same up to some uh, different uh, travel time from s one one to s two. So here these actually are the same plots, except uh, i two is shifted by fifty picoseconds, I believe, to to the right. You know, so here it's at seven, you know, seven seventy-five this peak, and here it's at eight hundred twenty-five picoseconds. So the, this time variation is very, very rapid. It's unresolvable by the human eye. It's also unresolvable by most CCD cameras or even the best, um, uh, the fastest photo detectors to date. Um, furthermore, you don't detect intensities where light is quantized, so. Uh, if you have a single photon detector, what you actually record is the time of arrival of, of the photon. So, so here I've just made some really, really bright source. So the, the red sticks here are the uh, arrival times of the photons. And the, the rate of, of detection of photons is proportional to this uh, intensity field here. And so based on these red sticks, right, the photon arrival times, you try to, um, you try to reconstruct you know, build an estimator for the instantaneous intensity field. And it's a terrible estimator. Most of the time for a realistic source, you get zero because you don't detect a photon. Um, but uh, the, cor the correlations between these fields does survive at weak signal to noise ratio in, in your reconstructed intensity field. So if you take this reconstructed intensity field, the blue line at I1, the blue line at I2, and you compute C, so this fractional um, excess intensity correlation, uh, this is what you get in green, right? So mostly, you know, over a thousand picoseconds, right? So one, na one nanosecond observation uh, where you see these, you know, 20 to 30 photons, you, you basically just see noise, right? You, you, you get something that's consistent with zero. But the signal is this tiny, this tiny bump here at 50 picoseconds. So if you integrate, uh, a little bit longer. So if you integrate a microsecond, so 10 to the 6 picoseconds, so do this a thousand times, uh, then you actually see it, uh, you see this excess uh, intensity correlation. And here I've assumed sort of a typical wavelength of 500 nanometers, spectral light, uh, a spectral resolving power of 5,000, and a timing precision of 10 picoseconds, which is roughly the uncertainty on this on this line here. So this is a really, really bright source, really bright source that's unrealistic. But this is just to uh, prove the point that um, uh, intensities can be correlated. And it's just the fact that if you take, uh, let's say, telescopes one and two very close to each other, they see the same intensity field. And so in that limit, 
this is I squared average over I average squared, which is measuring the fractional variance of, of the light, which I said was two. So um, yeah, that's the origin of the uh, intensity correlations. Okay. Um, so, uh, so you measure C and you measure, you can, if you set tau right, you can measure it to be uh, non-zero. Um, but how does that tell you about the position of, of, of a source? So you do the same thing as, as in amplitude interferometry, uh, except now you compute this intensity correlator, which is really a four point function of the electric field because the intensity is just E squared at each site. And if you go through the same math uh, as before, um, you get uh, uh, you get a, a number of terms now. So if you remember, there was this random phase here at the emission point, and uh, these brackets signify basically time averaging, or if you wish, averaging over the, these uh, random phases. So if you take the random phase from E1 here and, and cancel it against the negative of the random phase of, of, of this one, um, you just get the average intensity and likewise for, for, for the contraction there. And, and that will uh, just give you average intensity at one, divide by average intensity at one, same at two, minus one, that just gives you zero. Uh, but you can do the other another contraction as well. So the random phase in the electric field at telescope one, uh, it, well, you you can contract with the oops with the with the random phase at um, in the electric field at telescope two, and so this cross term um, between the between the blue terms and likewise between the between the red ones uh, is this excess intensity correlation, and if you go through that, uh, you basically find an excess intensity correlation that's uh, uh, one over the spread in wavelengths recorded. Uh, and the uh, timing resolution. And then, uh, yeah, that's that's roughly the size of the excess correlation if you set tau uh, to be the correct value. So commensurate with the longer time the light has to travel to two as compared to one. Um, and so, yeah, so so that that extra time then gives you some information on the global position of, of the source S. Um, so that's the global astrometric precision. And it's absolutely terrible. So it's only, I mean, it's not that bad, but it's it's nothing uh, nothing too great. And because the, the this global astrometric precision is not the wavelength over the baseline, uh, but it's more like the uh, uncertainty in the time of arrival, uh, which is maybe uh, uh, 10,000 or 100,000 wavelengths um, divided by the baseline. So this is not that great. Um, so it's not it's not unlike uh, some uh, device like Gaia. This uh, intensity interferometry has bad global astrometric precision. However, it has very good relative astrometric precision. So we cannot tell the global position of star A relative to uh, some global uh, celestial reference frame, but we can tell the angle between two sources A and B extremely accurately. So if you go through the same math as for the one source case, right? So uh, you record the total ele electric field at sites one and two, which is now a superposition of the electric field from, from A and the electric field from B, likewise at site two. Um, you, get, uh, you get this, again, this four point function of the electric field. And uh, I've color coded here the four electric, uh, uh, fields uh, depicted here, right? So um, what, what you're measuring is the propagation phase of A to one um, plus B to two, so that you, you, you measure the distance RA1 and RB2 uh, minus uh, RA2 and RB1. So that's one of the terms that comes out in this, uh, this four-point function. And so this doubly differential uh, distance, if you do some simple trigonometry, it's uh, the wave number of the light, so two pi over the wavelength times the baseline dotted into the relative angle between A and B. So uh, yeah, your correlation has really good 
uh, so really sharp information on the relative uh, angle of, of uh, B and A. And so in general, so this is what you get for two point sources. In general, what you get for a more extended image is this uh, excess correlation is the modulus squared of the Fourier transform of your image um, at some angular wavelength that's uh, given by the uh, so angular wave number that's given by the baseline over the uh, wavelength of the light. So that gives you a relative res angular resolution of lambda lambda over D, just like for an amplitude interferometer. Um, the, the difference here now is that it combines the, the best of uh, both worlds here. So, so it's the, for amplitude interferometers, it was also the wavelength over the baseline. But the wavelength was quite long for, in the radio, um, but the baseline was maximal. In the optical, the wavelength was is short. It's an optical wavelength, but the baseline could not be long uh, because you had to physically recombine the light. In intensity interferometry, uh, <clears throat> you get the best of both worlds because uh, you can measure the intensities at one and the intensities at two, and then only after after your observation offline you can correlate the light. So your baseline can be, uh, it can be kilometers. Um, and so you can improve upon the fiducial angular resolution by uh, making your baseline longer and keep an optical wavelength. So this is how you can get micro arc second precision uh, with an intensity interferometer. Okay, so this is a, a depiction of what the, what the actual, uh, Correlation, so the C looks like for two point sources. Uh, so, uh, so if you if you take the the baseline to be, or if you take the angle between the sources to be much less than a micro arc second, so much less than ten to minus eleven radians, then you see this excess correlation. But as the angle increases, you see this, uh, you see these fringes. So by measuring C, you get information on this on this angle here. Um, uh, okay, so this uh, uh, intensity interferometry was invented in 1954 by Hambury Brown, um, and then Hambury Brown and Twist uh, in in 1956 uh, basically demonstrated it in the lab and on a celestial source, namely Sirius. So what they did was they uh, had some artificial source, some some mercury lamp, um, and then they split the light uh, with some beam splitter here. And what they found was that the light recorded in this PMT and that PMT was correlated, right? So they demonstrated this photon bunching effect. So this intensity correlations at two different photodetectors in the lab. Uh, I believe this is the 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 number, the significance and number of sigma. So seven, seven sigma, uh, six sigma in a couple of experiment, a couple of independent runs. Um, then instead of a, using a mercury lamp in, 19, in the same year, they actually just used Sirius with some uh, leftover reflectors from World War II. And as they varied the baseline, they actually saw this intensity correlation drop off. So, um, so, so they saw, first of all, they saw excess correlation uh, which decreased with with baseline, which is uh, and from which they could infer the finite source, the finite source size of Sirius. So they measured it to be six point three milli arc seconds, uh, as you as is written in the caption here, which was the first measurement of that uh, quantity, the angular diameter, um, and is in fact uh, within ten percent of the true value, which I think is six point eight uh, milli arc seconds. Um, so that was their first device. Then uh, Hambry Brown um, went to uh, Australia uh, at Narabri or Narabri. I don't know how you pronounce it. Um, so at sea level, he built these six meter uh, reflectors basically on railroad cars that could sort of drive into the shed uh, when they were being stored. And so that you had a 200 meter baseline here uh, in the 60s and 70s. And so uh, they would measure the intensity correlations at these two sites. And uh, so this is a close-up of the device. Uh, so it's, as you can, as you might 
might be able to tell the tolerances on this device are are not quite as tight as on um, current imaging telescopes, which is one of the advantages of intensity interferometry. Um, and so what they were able to do is measure the angular diameter of 32 stars with exquisite precision. So uh, not just Sirius, but, but these sort of classic uh, bright stars in the sky. Um, and they got, uh, you know, so the typical angular diameter is uh, milli arc seconds, but then they got some to 30 micro arc second uh, precision from the ground without adaptive optics with, uh, shall I say, crappy telescopes mounted on railroad cars at sea level in Australia. Uh, and to remind you, so this 30 micro arc second precision, it's kind of an unfair comparison, but it's roughly the same precision at which the 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 size of the light ring of, of uh, the accretion disk of M87 was measured um, uh, much, much earlier. So why have most people not heard of it? So why was the technique abandoned after 1974? Um, <clears throat> there's two reasons. So the, the two reasons are the limited field of view and the limited signal to noise ratio. Um, so what I showed you on one of the previous slides was this excess intensity correlation as a function of the angle between the two stars. So you get these sharp fringes, but they sort of die out after a while. And that's because light from different wavelengths starts to destructively interfere after a while uh, and wash out these sharp fringes. So if the stars are too far apart, you don't get this sharp variation of the mutual coherence. So if the stars are farther than you know, 10 to minus seven uh, uh, radians, which is still a very small distance. Um, and it's unlikely to find two stars within that distance, typically. Uh, you don't get this sharp information. So that's why Hambury, Brown, and Twist only <clears throat> use it to do measurements of angular diameters of stars, right? So it's it's really good at measuring the morphology of, of, of an object, of a single object, but not at the relative position of uh, two objects. Well, it it is, but the it's unlikely to find two two stars that close together because of the limited field of view. Um, and the second limitation was the signal to noise ratio. So, um, as I as I mentioned, this total correlation uh, is set by uh, one over the timing resolution. So this fractional correlation C uh, gets to be very small if your uh, timing resolution is, is, is very slow. So there's two things you can do. Uh, you can narrow the band at which you uh, observe, observe the light. So by having a higher spectral resolving power and by shortening the, um, uh, the, the timing resolution. And so that's, um, uh, sorry, uh, so, the, the improvements in the signal-to-noise ratio just come from ultra-fast photon detectors that have now been developed that can detect the time of arrival of single photons to picosecond level precision uh, using uh, uh, um, these single single uh, these uh, superconducting nanowire single photon detectors or SNSPDs, um, as well as uh, you you can uh, increase the spectral resolving power now with uh, spectroscopic techniques that were not quite as mature yet um, back when Henry Brown and Twist uh, developed uh, intensity interferometry. Okay, so the signal to noise ratio is overcome by technology. The field of view is is is, is what we solve. So what we do in Epic, where we come in, is basically take intensity interferometry, but uh, as you collect the light. From star one, uh, from telescope one, you split this light into two paths of unequal length. So one path is longer by L1 than the other path. Likewise, at telescope two, it's longer by by uh, an amount L2. Um, then you spectrally split the light and you do this this correlation. Um, and so, what that does, the, the 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 real reason for why it increases this field of view, so overcomes this limitation, is that as this uh, angle between the two stars increases, uh, as I said, you're you're interfering the the sort of the, these short paths 
that are not crossing versus the crossing ones here. And at large angle, the cross paths in the middle here, they are longer than, than the sort of straightest paths from, from A to one and B to two. So uh, this relative time delay basically uh, lengthens the shorter paths by, by L1 and L2 to make this uh, differential distance the same. Um, so so you, you, you split the light and, and you create many more fringes, some of which have equal path lengths. Um, and so one way you can do this is, is basically as you and receive collimated light, have a 50-50 beam splitter, uh, then you're, it's not exactly equal path lengths, and then you recombine the light again, uh, spectrally split it, and then detect it. Um, so what it does is it takes this main intensity fringe and it splits it into four. So uh, for example, this new fringe is where the uh, light from uh, from uh, fr from the source is is delayed and uh, is extended in telescope one. Um, oops, um, this fringe here would be where it's delayed in in telescope two. This this fringe here is where it's delayed in both, and this is where it, it's not delayed at all. So you can sort of you you can take this main intensity correlation fringe and split it into four based on the four possibilities, right? You have a you have two two possibilities at each telescope. Um, and for two sources, what it does, as I said, you, you're sort of comparing RA1 plus R, RB2 minus RB1 and RA2. And, and the red and orange paths are longer than the green and blue. So this path extension just lengthens green and blue by a little bit. And what that does is it takes these sharp, sharp fringes and it creates a, another ghost fringe, this little red spike here. And it looks like a spike just because it's a log scale. But in reality, it's just a copy of, of this fringe pattern uh, centered at some reference angle, which is set by L1 plus L2 over the distance, uh, over the baseline distance. So this effectively increases the, the angle at which you can get mutual coherence between the sources. Um, yeah, so and and solves the limited field of view uh, problem. So, what are the capabilities? So, so we have these three phases uh, with fiducial specs of the instrument. So, the aperture diameter, timing resolution, spectral resolving power, and number of telescopes per site. And so, with four meter, two four meter dishes, uh, with commercially available timing resolution and commercially available spectroscopic gratings, you could achieve with uh, over uh, 10, uh, 10 to the four seconds of observation. So a few, a couple, three hours, you would achieve a 20 micro arc second light centroiding precision. So a factor of four better than a single uh, Gaia observation. Um, and the global, the global precision, uh, the, the, the main figure of merit is this uh, relative uh, light centroiding precision. And then for phase two, which is 10 meter class telescopes with better timing resolution already demonstrated in the lab. In fact, three picoseconds has already been demonstrated in the lab. Uh, you can get one micro arc second observation. Uh, and then in phase three, you can improve by another factor of 20 uh, by increasing the light collecting area with having many telescopes per site and higher resolving power and smaller timing resolution. So, um, yeah, uh, I think in the interest of time, I will skip this. Um, so uh, the technique works, it depends on the brightness of the source. So these numbers here were for uh, a, a, a sun-like star at 100 parsecs. Um, so here I'm showing you the typical signal to noise ratio in the phase two experiment. So this is the error on which you can measure this correlator in any one spectral channel. For This is for a main sequence star, so a sun at 100 parsec. So you can get um, relatively good signal, to, uh, relatively good precision of about 1% on this fractional intensity correlation in one channel. And uh, the, the actual signal is 10%. So you get a factor of 10 signal to noise ratio in each spectral channel, and then you measure it over as many as 10,000 spectral channels. So your overall signal to noise ratio is, is very large. <clears throat> um, 
And uh, yeah, so for um, this is for a blue giant at five kiloparsec, I believe, a white dwarf at uh, ten parsec. So all of these stars you can you can um, measure this on. Um, your light cent centroiding precision is optimal. So naively you say, okay, well, Ken, why are you taking 10, 10 kilometers? Uh, so you don't arbitrarily gain. So as you take the larger, your relative light centroiding precision improves, improves, improves. However, at some point there's a, it, it sort of saturates and then gets worse again. And that's basically where you start resolving the, the star itself. So remember, I'm, I said, really what you're doing is you're taking a Fourier transform squared of your image. But if your star has finite extent, that Fourier transform gets smaller, and, and then it becomes that much harder to detect. Uh, so there is some optimum distance, and it depends on the parameters of your experiment. It's typically between uh, 1 and 10 kilometers. Uh, but still, at 10 kilometers, your resolution is micro arc seconds, and your light centroiding precision can be better. Uh, so for phase 2, you can get uh, pico radian precision, so fractions of a micro arc second precision. And for phase three, another factor of 20 better. Um, this is just a repeat of the observation. So that for stars, the two main determining factors that tell you the precision of the observations are the temperature of the source, so how what the surface brightness is and the diameter. Um, and for a phase two, I think one phase two and phase three, one can even do light centroiding on, on quasars uh, quite accurately. Um, so yeah, in phase three, you get better numbers. Um, I will skip uh, a detailed explanation of this um, in the interest of time. So uh, I just want to say that uh, intensity interferometry can be performed on the ground in principle at sea level uh, because it's uh, entirely insensitive to atmospheric aberrations. So as this atmosphere fluctuates here, it imprints phases onto, the, onto, the, onto these paths. But at relatively small angles, it's the phase imprinted on the blue path is the same as the phase imprinted at the red path. Likewise, at site two, so orange and green will get the same phase. And the correlator is, is uh, doubly differential. So it's the difference of these two paths and the difference of those two paths. So it cancels out completely as long as the angle is small. And that basically tells you that the maximum field of view is set by the atmosphere. So this is no longer true if the angle is big enough. And that's about a, a, few, a few arc seconds. Um, Okay, so that's uh, my introduction on astrometry and how uh, EPIC can improve the, the field of view of intensity interferometry and ultimately the capabilities. Uh, I don't have, I have no time left, but let me just uh, quickly flash uh, what the, the science applications are. Um, so what can you do with this, with these capabilities? One thing you can do is measure, uh, characterize binary orbits very well. So uh, as two white dwarfs orbit each other, you can trace out their relative separation uh, very accurately along some baseline direction. So if you do this, I believe, I think I took 40 nights of observations here. Uh, you can measure things like the semi-major axis, the inclination angle, uh, and some of the other Keplerian orbital elements, as well as the component masses and the distance to the binary star uh, to sub percent precision. So uh, here the masses are at uh, yeah at a half a percent uh, precision with phase two parameters. Um, you do need to break some degeneracies with uh, spectroscopy, uh, otherwise there's some mass semi-major axis and distance degeneracy. Um, uh, I think that the most home run application is uh, exoplanet detection. So you can look for the astrometric wobble that the planet imparts on its host star. Um, Gaia uh, has some capabilities and in fact has measured some exoplanets this way. Uh, not, not quite, I think it's discovered one such system so far uh, that was not previously known. Um, but it will it will see uh, it will see many uh, by the time DR5 uh, comes around is is released. 
Um, however, we can do, uh, especially on, on nearby stars, we can do uh, two or three orders of magnitude better or four orders of magnitude better on very nearby stars uh, with phase three. And so by, by being able to measure this relative separation between the host star of the planet and some reference star very precisely, we can measure much smaller masses um, uh, in print, uh, as low as a an Earth mass around a sun-like star at, at 20 parsec, or uh, for phase three, uh, for host stars much farther than, than 20 parsec. Um, the galactic acceleration field is about a nano arc second per square year and looks like this at about one kiloparsec. Uh, that's very difficult to measure, but with phase, sorry, with phase three I th and, and 10 years of observations, I think it should be doable. Uh, we can also do things like uh, measure the relative separation between the two images uh, during a stellar microlensing event. So the main image uh, here, as well as this uh, additional strongly lensed image there. So by measuring that, you get very accurate measurements of the of the um, Einstein radius and therefore the mass of the of the microlens. Um, again, to sub percent precision. Uh, you can do parallax measurements uh, and help calibrate the cosmic distance ladder, um, which is helpful for determining the expansion rate of the universe. Um, if you're interested, I can tell you about this. I think uh, this is work in progress on measuring uh, the relative separation of quasar images, um, which I think will give you information about very small scale dark matter substructure. Um, so. Uh, the bottom line is that I think these uh, these images. Uh, so this is with David Kaplan. The the relative position between the these uh, quasar images is fluctuating stochastically uh, by about uh, uh, one micro arc second or so, or a little bit less, 0.1 micro arc second from the dark matter structure in in the lens galaxy. Um, and I think this should be measurable with phase two or phase three. Um, so uh, final slide, um, uh, we are working with uh, Nick Konidaris at, at Carnegie Observatory uh, to demonstrate this uh, in the laboratory. So with artificial light sources in a sort of 200 meter setup in, in a parking lot, um, just like Hambury, Brown and Twiss uh, did it in 1956 with a mercury lamp. Uh, so we wanna demonstrate the, this path extension technique. Uh, there is a, I'm, I'm doing, um, I have work in progress also with a student at NYU, Calvin Chen, a postdoc at NYU, and Junwu Huang, who's faculty at PI, uh, on an ex, uh, a variant of the expanding photosphere method, again, to do cosmic distances accurately, but then with, uh, with intensity interferometry. Um, so I, that's, that's it for my, my presentation. So I'm just leaving you here with the picture of the of the instrument again. Um, so yeah, the bottom line is that I think you can achieve uh, light centroiding precision. So measure the relative separation of stars um, to uh, pico radian precision. So sub micro arc second um, in the later later phases of an experiment, uh, as long as those sources uh, are separated by a few arc seconds. So so we've. Uh, by less than a few arc seconds. So, so we've uh, extended the field of view of the technique and and see what you could do for certain scientific applications if you pull out all of the stops uh, in terms of uh, spectroscopy and timing resolution of the light. Um, so, so yeah, the bottom line is that uh, you, one should not just look at the uh, position of sources on your photo detector or measure the wavelength. I think there's a lot of information if you record also the time of arrival of the photons uh, and compare them in, in separate telescopes. So, and I'll, I'll leave you with this quote from Hembury Brown in, in 1974, which is when uh, uh, his uh, Nairobi uh, observatory uh, shut down. Um, and so uh, that's some source of inspiration. Yeah, thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Ken, for this very interesting and uh, epic talk. I, so now we are open to questions. Remember that if you're watching on YouTube, you can ask your questions uh, in the chat of the channel. 
And then while you do that, I'm going to open the floor to see if maybe anybody in the Zoom meeting has a question. Well, while you think about, oh, okay, you, you all go ahead. Okay, so can I do have a question? I mean, very naive question, because I, I mean, of course I haven't, I have no idea about astrometry. Uh, but so most of these things, I mean, all, all, all these observations are done in the in the visible spectrum, right? Okay, is there any yeah. use of of thinking about extending this method of to, you know, as a high energy physicist, I always think about high energies to mm -hmm. to things with I don't know gamma rays or X rays or um, I mean going out away yeah. from the visible. Right. In principle, you can do intensity interferometry at all wavelengths. So you can do it at longer wavelengths in the infrared, which sometimes is useful if you want to see through dust, or you can even do it in the radio. But in radio, uh, you might as well do amplitude interferometry. So if you can do amplitude interferometry, there's no reason to, to measure some higher point function of the electric field. Um, you can go to higher uh, uh, frequencies as well, higher energies. Uh, as long as you you have a source that emits them, so the the issue is is that typically, um, the you know stars only get so bright. Even quasars only you know I guess they're inner regions they emit in X rays, but um, yeah, you you typically run out of sources at very high uh very high energy. So their non thermal X ray and gamma gamma ray emission is typically subdominant. So you. So for this technique to get enough signal to noise ratio, you need to collect a lot of photons okay. and you need to collect them with high spectral resolution. So you need to split the light in many bands and record it with good timing resolution. So these detectors, uh, these uh, single uh, single photon detectors, they, they are primarily, sorry, it's getting taking some time to go through here. I, uh, they are pr primarily, uh, my computer is like they're primarily developed for uh, optical and infrared wavelengths. They do work at X-rays, but with worse uh, with worse timing resolution. So this uh, picosecond demonstrations have mostly been done in optical and infrared. Uh, and, and yeah, I, I should say also the uh, as you go to higher energies, the coherence time of let's say an X-ray light source is that much shorter and so it's that much harder to detect the the sort of uh, temporal correlations of that field yeah so yeah, i wish it was possible i mean it is possible in principle just in practice i think it it's not achievable so i think blue blue light is the ideal uh the ideal case so so the blue light from a quasar, the blue light from a hot star like a white dwarf or a, a blue giant, that's sort of the best case scenario. Yeah. Thank you. Any questions, Roberto or Joel? Yeah, yes, I have a question. I have two questions. I mean, one question and a, a, a doubt that maybe it's nothing related with, it, with the talk itself. But anyway, the, 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 the question that I was wondering is because it seems that the 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 the, the epic is very good for for this to resolve these different sources or sources that could be affected by different uh, situation like uh, when the, when you mentioned the micro lensing or mm -hmm. other other phenomena. But I was wondering, because of this time resolution, is it possible to to see or to maybe to measure? fluctuation due to gravitational waves or something like ah. you, you make a, a small shift between, between between the path of the two light but uh, in, prin in principle yes in principle mm -hmm. yes so um and the um yeah there, there's two effects so there's a time of arrival uh and the angle uh the angle of arrival of the photons so you can measure gravitational waves in this way and if if let's say there were no atmosphere and you measured uh, a source, say uh, coming from the celestial north pole and one in the celestial equator, so at ninety degrees, then you would get a relative angle of arrival 
uh, oscillation proportional to the strain. So if you have a gravitational wave with a strain of 10 to the minus 15, then you would get a 10 minus 15 radian order of magnitude uh, relative angular ang angle of arrival. Um, and so Epic can measure that, except 90 degree separations are uh, not feasible, uh, mainly due mainly because of atmospheric aberrations. So, um, yeah. So the 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 ang the the angle the field of view is limited by this isoplanetic patch angle. So a few arc seconds, and then because the angle is so narrow, the gravitational wave affects both both light paths in the same way, uh, and so the any phases cancel out, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, if you okay. do it in space, then there's no limitation on the angle. But I think in space, one may as well do amplitude interferometry. So I, I haven't, I've, I've tried thinking about it, but but so far we have not identified a, a gravitational wave detection use case. Yeah. Okay. And the, the other, because when you just uh, recent, you showed the... These two telescopes, it's like an old image that you yes presented. yes. The, those telescopes look like very close. Oh, I mean, by the design, like this uh, Cherikov telescope for the. I mean, those are for gamma rays, but to measure right. the blue light from the from this uh, showering of part. Uh, yes, exactly, part and 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 it's something that I didn't mention due to lack of time due to time constraints. But so intensity interferometry didn't die completely in 1974. In fact, uh, several researchers have tried to revive the technique. And as you said, uh, Cherenkov, so, so cosmic ray telescopes detecting the Cherenkov emission from uh, cosmic rays have basically look like this picture. They, they care about very fast detection of, of light, but they don't care so much about imaging. So indeed, um, people uh, have demonstrated intensity interferometry with a present day um, uh, uh, Cherenkov telescope arrays. So the Veritas, uh, Veritas, Hess, MAGIC collaborations, they've all, again, measured angular diameters of stars uh, in this way. Um, yeah, because and precisely because the tolerances on the telescope are not so stringent. Um, if you want to do EPIC, uh, the optical quality of the telescope does need to be better than what is depicted here or what is used in Cherenkov telescopes because you need to do the spectral splitting. So to get enough signal to noise ratio on distant stars, you need the spectral resolving power, which means you need a tighter point spread function. Um, so, so our idea is applicable only on telescopes with good uh, optical quality. It, it need not be quite as good as Keck, but it needs to be better than than what was done at Narabri or what is currently uh, implemented in Cherenkov telescopes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right. So I think that we are at the end of this webinar. Thank you all for joining us, and thank you, Ken, for giving uh, this very interesting webinar. Uh, for all you who are connected, remember that. We have this every two or every week uh, on Wednesdays. Usually we have an, an upcoming webinar next week where Ren Suze will be talking about the GWST and uh, and then uh, keep uh, stay posted, stay put on for next announcements of uh, upcoming webinars. Thank you again. I hope that you have a great week and I'll see you all next week. Thank you.